Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we have another five guns video for you. Uh, these have been a, a very requested video concept. You guys always uh, send us all different kinds of ideas. And today we're going to be talking about the top five antique rifles. And my question to you is, how have we not done this yet? I don't know. There's so much stuff always going on and a lot of ideas just slip through the cracks and then we realize like, what? Yeah. We haven't done that yet? I, I, I finally, I realized, <laughs> I was looking back through some of our five minute videos and I realized that we hadn't even done a, just a top five antique rifles. And you know, we are absolute nuts when it comes to these older firearms and everything. Mm. And uh, when we say antique, you know, antique is a pretty specific term. Generally a gun that's over a hundred years old. Uh, but I, I believe, uh, quote me if I'm wrong on this, but 1899 uh, or, or earlier mm. in terms of uh, antique status. Pretty sure that's uh, the typical you know, the classification. The ATF maintains a, a really long list of established mm. antiques, like guns that are considered uh, an antique. Uh, so it's one of those things that sometimes a gun can be considered antique just by its collectability. Uh, in certain circles, people might consider it antique for that. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to pretty much say that an antique is a gun that's over 100 years old. Yeah, also something interesting about antique rifles, I mean, specific firearms that are considered antiques is that you don't have to go through an FFL to buy them. If they're on a website or something like that, you can actually have them shipped usually right to your door. They're not it's, firearms. And especially black powder guns, you know, stuff like it's that. Weird things like yeah. it's not considered a firearm. Yeah, yeah and there's two yeah. air quotes, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, bunny rabbits. <laughs> All right, so the first gun that we're going to get into now. What we did with these uh, guns is we selected uh, some that are that are based on, um, you know, maybe just a uh, lower price and mm. availability, something that's a little bit easier to get, and then we'll be getting up into some that are a little bit harder to get, uh, but still highly collectible, and uh, and they're chosen for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, I would say that somebody that's wanting to get into antique firearms and all one of the most available antique firearms right now is probably the martini henry oh yeah um this is a mark one grade two rifle this is actually a pretty difficult gun to find so it might have been a bad one to show you but uh the martini henry series of rifles are awesome peabody style uh, you know breech loading rifle so a falling block breech loading rifle fires a 577 450 martini henry uh, center fire cartridge uh, reasonably good power, good case capacity. Ammo sourcing is going to be a little bit on the difficult side. Yeah, I mean, we, we pretty much have to hand load, you know, all of our martini ammo. I mean, if you want to buy it on the commercial market, normally you're talking like eight bucks a shot. Yeah, or more, know, so. depending on what you get. So mm -hmm. uh, we do have a complete uh, reloading series on the 577 450 martini cartridge if you want to check it out. Also, we do have a few uh, range videos on the martini if you mm -hmm. care to check them out. Uh, you know, check the description box below for more if you want to see dedicated video on this particular gun. Uh, nice thing about the martinis is, there's several of them out there that uh, IMA brought in mm. uh, from the Nepalese cache uh, over in the Royal Palace of, in Nepal there. And they brought in a bunch of long levers, short levers, Gehendras, Frankot patterns, pallets, pallets of guns. I mean, literally brought them over stacked like cordwood. Now, mm. That particular um, you know, cache has been constantly bought from for about the past, what, 15 years or so? Or has it been longer than that? Uh, I want to say it was like mid mid to late 90s. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely been a, been a while since that group of guns came in, but they are still available. Uh, there's a lot of different grades available. They are out there. Uh, it is an affordable piece of history uh, that can generally be shipped just about anywhere in the world. And uh, nice part is they can be had for you know five to $700. So that's in a great piece cases. of history that this you can clean up. Yeah, the, the Mark 1s are certainly more desirable because there are very few of these guns oh, yeah. that came through and there's a lot of really interesting examples that we've actually had the privilege of sorting through when all these guns were over in the um, warehouse over at Atlanta Cutlery. Right. Um, sadly, you know, that, that warehouse has been sold back to IMA. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so all those recently. guns have been relocated back to IMA now. So that's, yeah. that's gun number one is mm -hmm. a Martini Henry. If you're a military surplus rifle junkie and especially if you want to get into antiques. Well, especially uh, infields too. I oh, mean, you know, yes. Just British yeah. guns. Yeah, oh, the, my God. Uh, the, the, the martinis are pretty much a way to go. Now, I would say number two on the list, and we're going kind of in, in order of availability mm -hmm. and price. Um, the Schmidt Rubin 1889s. Guys, these rifles are still very commonly available. Uh, you know, they are an antique. Um, you know, there's a lot of them out there. The market, it has quite a few of these rifles floating around right now. I mean, they are out there. They are available. Uh, they fire a 7.5 by 53 and a half millimeter, uh, you know, round. 
and they made that so that when the new GP11 came out in 1911 that you couldn't chamber the newer cartridge in the older gun because the older gun can't take the same pressure of the new GP11 cartridge. Mm -hmm. So the original GP90, 1890 mm -hmm. cartridge, um, fired like a 200 grain round nose bullet. I believe it might have even been like paper patch, you used like a semi-smokeless powder. It was a really like forward thinking cartridge at the time. And this particular gun is a 12 shot repeater. Mm -hmm. So it has double the magazine capacity of a K, uh, K11 or 1911 or even a K31, K31 service rifle. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they do have their shortcomings. I mean, you, you have to trim your brass in order to get it to chamber. You have to, you know, size it and set the neck back a little bit more. Um, they are an interesting curio. They're interesting to shoot. It's an interesting footnote uh, in the development of small arms for the it military. Is. I mean, the big reasoning like for the changes with K31 with the bolt design, this has got a very long uh, bolt on it. Same thing with like the 96 11, or 96s and 9611s and then even the, the K11 itself. It's got the very long bolt and the reason that it's not really set up for GP11 is because of the locking lugs and such. It's just right. kind of a kind of a weak system for that powerful cartridge. It but is. Uh, these guns are great. Uh, you know, Eric bought this one a while back. We did a video on it, and then when we were in Vegas one year at the Antique Arms Show, I found one and picked myself up one just because I had to have one in the collection. They're affordable. You know, they There's are. There's no I, doubt. I, mean, I paid you, four bills for it. You yeah, know, I was going to say you can so. you can pick them up between you know three to four hundred dollars mm -hmm. depending on the condition of the gun and where you get it from. Yeah, and this um, one's got that really cool rack number. Absolutely, on it, so. they're still bringing in a lot of these uh, 1889s. Mm -hmm. It's definitely an older firearm. Definitely a cool antique. So you got the Martini in number one, you got the 1889 in uh, slot number two. Uh, number three is probably one that uh, some of you guys may or may not be familiar with. Uh, this is an 1870s Dutch Beaumont service yeah. rifle. I wasn't familiar with it until Eric picked one up. I'm like, what? What is that? Yeah, so it's, you know? um, it's a really interesting take on a uh, repeater. Okay, so it's an 11 by 52 rimmed Dutch Beaumont cartridge. So it's basically kind of like a... Uh, Imagine a 4570 neck down. Mm -hmm. So you've got like basically a parent case. You can compare it to like a 5090 sharps. Okay. That's what we use to convert the brass for this. You trim it down, anneal it, neck it down, and you basically have the same projectile that you shoot out of a 4570, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but it's in a kind of a neck down mm -hmm. configuration, and it's a four shot repeater. It has a Vitaly magazine conversion system on it that holds three rounds in the box and one in the chamber, so you get a four shot repeater. And you got to remember, this is 1870s technology. So uh, the Netherlands, you know, when, when they had this rifle as their service rifle in those days, it was actually one of the most advanced uh, infantry rifles of the day. I mean, it was a repeater. It was a you know, somewhat smaller bore. They were going with that whole neck down mm -hmm. concept to try to get a little bit more velocity. They it made the, the projectile a little bit smaller mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, the weight, you know, trying to, to get a little bit more velocity and mm -hmm. distance out of the rifle. But the neat thing about the Dutch Beaumont is a lot of people don't know about them. Mm -hmm. So you can generally pick these up for really reasonable money. I mean, you can find Dutch Beaumonts for between three and five hundred dollars. Well, and especially if you just shop around. I mean, you might come across a shop that they have a Dutch Beaumont sitting on the shelf, and they don't have a clue what it is. And right. you might be able to walk out of there with it for one hundred and fifty bucks or less. Yes. And you one know? of the one of the most distinguishing characteristics of this gun, in case you guys are looking for them, and, and one thing I want to make sure you realize: always check the stock around mm. the magazine conversion to make sure it's not split. That's a very common thing to happen with these is you'll see splits on the stock right here. And all it takes is a little bit of a jostling or a bump and that stock you know, tends to split there because it's thin. Also, another common thing on these that you have to pay attention to is when you pull the bolt back, there's actually a little ejector block that's in there and that block has a tendency to get lost very easily and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to replace. So if that block is missing, the gun won't eject. Yep. So if you plan on shooting it, that's probably something to consider. Another distinguishing characteristic of the Beaumont rifle is the bolt handle. It's got this big, massive bolt, and it has a, a large look to it, almost like a Mirada. But the reason that they do this is because the inside of this bolt actually has a big old strong V V spring, like a big leaf spring in it, in the shape of a V that you have to compress to put it back together, and that's what fire, uh, fires the gun. Pretty interesting. It's an interesting design for sure. And you know, you mentioned like the the way the caliber is neck down basically and takes 45, like a 458 projectile. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting seeing these antiques and the big bore stuff going down the line and you, you get into like the 7.5 and like 7 millimeter that we're going to talk about in a minute. Everything yep. went short 
uh, or uh, you know smaller caliber Spitzer projectiles. Yep. You know farther trajectory, flatter trajectory, you know longer range. It's just interesting to see the you know history on the table and just how the advancement of firearms technology kind of went through the line. It certainly yeah. is. You know around the turn of the century, from like you know 1870s and really even before that, yeah. but but let's just say around 1870s to the you know late turn of the century there. A lot of infantry guns use some form of 45 diameter bore. I mean, or you larger. look at, or, yeah, or yeah. larger. So that's not uncommon for antique rifles to be, you know, a 45 caliber bore or even larger. So you got the Beaumont, you got the 1889, you got the Martini Henry. The next one that we're going to mention in this lineup is going to be the Rolling Block. And I'm going to let thing. Chad hold that up and I'll explain a little bit. So the Remington Rolling Block was an attempt by Remington to make a mass produced. Um, you know, single shot military rifle that they could, um, you know, market to various militaries around the world, and uh, and they've been used all over the world. Uh, you know, and in some cases they were obsolete even at the time that they were issued. Mm -hmm. But um, it allowed the countries that Remington sold these to to actually arm a heck of a lot of people for not a lot of money. I mean, these were, compared to repeating rifles and other things like that, were actually a very affordable option for a military to buy for their soldiers and everything. And some cases, a lot of uh, militaries had policies of making sure that their that their indigenous troops, so like if they were a, uh, let's just say they were a kingdom and they had, uh, you know, various uh, colonies and stuff, they might have wanted to make sure that the troops in their colonies had like one weapon technology behind them. So what better way than to buy a Remington rolling block and, they, you know, your troops and your colonies have like a single shot rifle or something like that. It's the same idea with the martinis, Pretty you know, much. all the martinis got sent to India and Nepal and such as that and, yeah. you know, all the... Uh, all the colonies of Britain at the time, and then they moved on with the you know better infield technology and kept their peons with older yeah. technology, just so there wouldn't be that yeah they they kind of be uh, behind the curve a little bit. But well, the Remington Rolling Block has probably been used by so many different militaries all around the world. Now the one that Chad just picked up here, this is a forty-three Spanish mm -hmm. Argentine contract Rolling Block. This um, one's neat. I love this gun. It is. We have done a video on this exact gun in case you guys want to check it I, out. And we have a video on the Beaumont as well. I love uh, the action of these things. It's just great. And like Eric mentioned, you know, they're inexpensive to produce because they are single shot. And they're very, very strong action. They are. I mean, they can take a, a pounding, you know, cartridge. And uh, I was amazed at the accuracy of this gun. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were just ringing like 250-yard steel targets with boring regularity with this big old pill. I mean, you could just literally see the thing arcing in like a football. But... They are right. wonderful, wonderful guns. Well, in yeah. terms of contracts, I'll, I'll touch on this very briefly because this is something that we're probably going to have to save for when we actually do the video on mm -hmm. this particular Remington rolling block. But they were produced uh, on up through before World War One, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say like the last rolling block was in 1912 or so, uh, if I'm not mistaken there. And those were for Norway. Uh, you know, a lot of the Norwegian rolling blocks that you see out there are chambered in some wicked cool cartridges. And some of them kind of start to... Uh, get a little bit more along the lines of the upper end of what the action can take. So those are interesting. I mean, and the Swedish rolling blocks are so awesome. Yep. The fit and finish is beautiful on them. The markings on them, they're just really cool. So from a standpoint of collectability, the rolling block is definitely in this list because um, there's so many different contracts. Mm -hmm. Collectability-wise, I mean, they were used by anybody from Venezuela, Argentina, Mexico, tons of South American countries, uh, Norway, Sweden used them. I mean, just all over the place, the Remington rolling block has been been out there and, and been there and done it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, though, the Remington rolling block, despite being an American design, wasn't really something that was widely it wasn't accepted popular here. here. <laughs> okay, so that's why they had to take their sales overseas, and yeah. they were dumping these things off for next to nothing. Now... They're not cheap anymore, though. Okay. No, they're not, <laughs> Yeah, sadly. Remington rolling blocks were kind of going up in price a little bit. This is gun number four, obviously, mm. so we're getting a little bit more expensive. Remington rolling blocks can generally be had for a beater. You can get them for starting out around 350 maybe 400 bucks. We're talking dingy stocks, maybe a crusty board, but maybe sound mechanics. Mm. You start getting into up in, you know, up into the examples like you see here. Yeah, 700 you're gonna be, bucks. You know, seven to eight hundred dollars, maybe on up to about twelve to fourteen hundred, depending on the example, the rarity of the contract, the configuration. Obviously, there's carbines that are worth more money because they're shorter versions. Mm. They can bring a little bit more money. Yeah, some folks might be wondering why we don't have any like old Winchesters or anything like that in here. You know, like cowboy guns such as that. You know. 
they're really cool and all, and they're awesome antiques, but the, the, the price just keeps them out of a lot of people's hands. Not affordable. I mean, you're, you're talking $3,000 plus dollars in a lot of cases. Some of you them know? are more than that. I mean, oh, I some, know. Some of the I'm ones saying that the are low in, end. Yeah, some of those that are in really good condition, some of the old Winchesters can bring up to ten grand. Oh, I know. for a certain but example. The, these guns are kind of like the working man's antiques. You know, I mean, they they, are. They, these are very interesting, very affordable, you know, and to be honest with you, I mean, neither one of us really own any old classic cowboy guns just for that reason, just because they are so prohibitively expensive. There's two reasons. One reason is because they're prohibitively expensive, like Chad mentioned, but then also another thing to consider is that there are so many high quality oh, God, reproductions God, yeah. out there that if you just want a gun scratch to shoot and you want to just kind of scratch the itch and you want to enjoy the nostalgia and history of an old cowboy era gun, you can call up, you know, anybody from like Petter Soli, Uberti. you know, Rossi, Uberti, you know, Henry makes their original Henry. Mm. So instead of like going out and trying to find an original <laughs> Henry rifle, you can buy an actual Henry that's made by Henry now in, in 44-40 centerfire and, and there you go. You yeah. got the gun for a fraction of the price and it's still just as awesome as the original. Uh, so moving on to gun number five, uh, here we have a Springfield trap door. All right. Now, um... This is an 1873 uh, model. Now there's a lot of variants of the trap door. We're not going to go into every little bell and whistle and every nut and bolt, uh, but the trap door was basically a kind of stopgap measure to convert. Uh, now, now these are actually a you know purpose-made uh, mm -hmm. gun, but the idea initially was to have a conversion type system that they could convert existing muskets over uh, to a a breech loading. Uh, you know, gun. Uh, cartridge contained, yeah. Cartridge platform, contained, yeah. So. so the military realized that a breech loading rifle was uh, definitely something that would be in the wave of the future. And the 4570 is an awesome cartridge. Uh, there's a lot of history to these trapdoors. We will have a video coming out on this particular gun. Uh, it has an original leather sling. It's been with the gun ever since. That's awesome. Um, this particular example is in pretty nice shape. It's all matching. A gun like this, you're going to drop about a thousand bucks for one. So you're starting to get a little bit more on the expensive side. When you start getting into the American antiques, you're going to start getting into some dang money. Yeah, if you talk about people are proud of. Oh, I know. You talk about just American military rifles, and especially old Springfield muskets and such. I mean, you can have you can have ten thousand dollars in an American rifle collection. Easy. You, you can. Know. And well, the, the particular uh, gentleman that I bought this rifle from, it's been in his family since those days. So It, it was, took a it, while for him to get rid of it. I mean, he, he was yeah. almost like, oh, I don't know. But, yeah. he, didn't I mean, wanna, he didn't want to let it go. But he knew it was going to a good home. Exactly. For sure. So, so with the American yeah. surplus, um, you're generally going to start running plan. into so some of the more expensive prices. Uh, you mm -hmm. start getting into the Crags, which is another excellent uh, older firearm. Mm -hmm. You know, the Crag Jorgensen, uh, wonderful, wonderful service rifle, mm -hmm. but again, very expensive. Yeah. Um, you start getting into Springfield 03s, you know, definitely, you know, 100 year old design. But again, very expensive. All your American surplus, you might as well just figure on a grand for a really good, clean example of each rifle, you're, you're going to have several thousand dollars tied up in a collection of antiques from the American side. Oh so that's God. why this is the last gun, because of the price, availability. Now, availability, there's tons of trapdoors out there. They're all over the place. Oh yeah, that's because nobody wants to buy them. <laughs> well, well, no, 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 numbers. I mean, they made a lot of these oh, I things. Know. So there's a lot of them out there, but because of the stigma people associate with them, and because of, oh, well, it was great grandpa's old gun or something like that, th there's that stigma that American shooters are just willing to pay more money for an American-made um, you know, service rifle from way back in the day than they would this Dutch Beaumont. Yep. No one cares about a Dutch Beaumont, although the quality of both these rifles is very similar, if not a touch better on the edge of the Beaumont, mm -hmm. being maybe just a little bit better rifle than the trapdoor. But... It's, it's all a supply and demand thing, but it's also just the demand. The yeah. demand isn't there for the Beaumont like it is for the trapdoor. So One of the other interesting things that I think about the, the trapdoor, when I think about the trapdoor in general, is just the caliber. You know, 4570 is a caliber that has stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, many modern uh, firearms that are chambered, even handguns, you know, like the BFR revolvers from Magnum Research that are chambered in 4570. And it's still just a powerhouse of a cartridge, and with modern designs, you can get some butt stomping loads oh, yeah. out of that thing. And yep. it's just an awesome, awesome caliber. You also notice uh, when you look at reloading data for 4570 that you know they have trapdoor specific mm -hmm. loads 
And then they have uh, lever modern actions. gun specific well, loads. Yeah, you got lever action loads, and then you have like uh, drop breach or breach loaded guns like yeah. the Ruger number ones. So you've got three levels of, of you yeah. know pressure pretty much. Yeah. If you shoot a modern load in that, you're likely to Boom. blow the gun up. Yeah, you're going to blow so. this gun up if you shoot modern 45, 78. All right. So, so wild there, card. there's five guns, but we always have a wild card. There's a number six. Schneider, man. It's a Schneider. Little carbine. Yeah. It's so, a Portuguese contract? It is. This particular gun Ooh, is a I Portuguese Navy contract uh, Schneider rifle. It is a carbine. Nice short package. Um, now, <laughs> the reason I chose this Portuguese one is because you know, there's a lot, just like a lot of other antique rifles that are out there, you're going to run into um, a lot of odd kind of contracts where, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a short run of guns was made for a specific country mm -hmm. or something like that. One of the guns that comes to mind is like the FN-49 Venezuelan contracts. I think Hugo Chavez ordered like 8,000 of them. Mm -hmm. So that means there's only 8,000. So a lot of these production numbers are well known and well documented. So sometimes you can you can identify a specific contract and then know that that gun was made for Portugal. And then you know how many guns are out there and how limited it is. And then you can kind of start to draw some conclusions on how rare it is to you and what kind of money it might be worth. Now, despite that, um, you can pick up these little Portuguese Navy guns for like a grand. Mm. So see, that's why it's a wild card. I mean, you're kind of in like a thousand dollar range on something like this, but it's a it's a conversion of like basically a three band infield, and then later on they started purpose building them, of course. But mm -hmm. an, an initially, early on, it was meant to just be a breech loading conversion of the existing three band infield musket, uh, basically the P53 that we mm -hmm. used in the uh, Civil War. Yep. Okay. The South used the P53, the three band infield. So imagine a three band infield, but converted to a breech loader. Um, these guns are awesome. We are going to have a uh, specific range video coming out on this particular gun. Still working Production out the, date of 1875. We're still working out the details on reloading the ammo because it yes. is a little bit of a bear to get this yes. 577 loaded up. Yep. But this is kind of it's a carbine version of you know the full size Schneider, and uh, that that gun is really really neat. I, I really need to pick one of those up. Jacob Schneider, I believe he was an American. So Schneider, Schneider, yeah. So <laughs> so anyway, you know, hopefully you guys kind of can glean some information from this video, and if you're wanting to get into collecting antique rifles, um, you know, you'll kind of get an idea of what's out there and and the price points that are out there. And guys, this definitely is not all of them. This isn't even close to all of the antique rifles that are out there that are noteworthy. Oh, good God, There's so man. many others that deserve a mention, but it's just hard to put them all in a lineup. I mean, if you have to choose five, six with a wild card, you, you really have to kind of decide like, hey, you know, I have to consider price mm -hmm. point, availability, because if somebody watches this video and goes, oh, well, that's a cool gun, I'd love to have it, and, it, and it's just one of those one-off weird things that's not available, it's no fun. You know, it's no fun to try to collect something that's ridiculously hard to find. Yeah. All the guns on this table are pretty much available if you look hard enough, mm -hmm. and they're priced reasonable enough to where the average person can afford them. Yep. So that's what we were going for. That's pretty cool. It is. You're the, you know, Eric's more the antique guy. I just kind of stand here and, you know, nod. Mm -hmm. Not an agree. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'm glad we finally got to make this video. I know we've um, been wanting to do a five uh, five guns video about antiques, and I don't know why it's taken us this long to do it. Probably because I'm not really that big of an antique guy. I love mill serps, you know, and I, yeah. you know, I, I know a ton about like uh, the fin M39s and like the Finnish rifles and such as that, and like some of the Swiss guns. He's more of a Swiss aficionado, but you know, he's just got this passion for these guns, and oh, yeah. it kind of rubbed off on me over the years, and I'm. I'm starting to get more into it. It happens. You know, it it happens. does. Well, another thing, too, we do have a video coming up soon that's called uh, What Makes a Mosin Rare. We're going to break out a bunch of rare and interesting Mosins, and we're going to talk about you know, why, why a Mosin could ever be expensive. Because that's one of the common questions I get all yeah. the time from people. They go, well, why should I pay 350 bucks for a Finnish M39? It's just a Mosin, right? The Russians made 30 million of them, blah, 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 right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, well you, they're not all made, well, <laughs> they're, crazy they're not all the same gun. You, you, know? you, see the, you see the price on regular Mosins. I've seen some regular uh, 9130s for like 300 bucks. I'm like, holy cow, I could get yeah. a Finnish M39 for 50 bucks more. You well, know? stay tuned for that video. <laughs> We're going to talk about why people are asking that kind of money yeah. for some of those guns, and I'll show you some examples of the guns that people are trying to fetch those higher amounts of money for and maybe I, you guys can glean some information on why exactly people try to demand those kinds of uh, sums out of those guns so yep. thank you for watching today's video we appreciate the support hopefully you enjoyed this uh, blast from the past here we have a full review coming up on the Springfield trapdoor here mm -hmm. 
and the rolling block, and, and also the, the Portuguese Schneider. Schneider. So half these guns already have videos, the other half are getting videos. So thank you for watching today, and we'll catch you next time. Take it easy, guys.